This is the Keys to the Top Rate of Rise series, brought to you by Roast Magazine. Today, we're talking with Candace Madison, Director of Roasting at the Crown, Royal Coffee Lab and Tasting Room. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to the Rate of Rise series. Elevated Conversations on Roasting is brought to you by Keys to the Shop and Roast Magazine. Uh, Roast Magazine, of course, is one of the longest running and the most respected trade journals in the coffee industry. And they have a new series called Audio Articles, uh, which is presenting articles from Roast Magazine Archive covering coffee from a technical perspective. So if you want to keep up with the latest research, knowledge, and insights from scientists and subject matter experts and professionals from all across the industry, then you definitely need to subscribe to the audio articles from Roast Magazine. To do that, just go to uh, roastmagazine.com slash audio articles. You can peruse episodes, and you can also subscribe on SoundCloud to access new issues as they are released. Now, one of the articles that came out was on thermodynamics, and it was by today's guest, Candace Madison. So Candace has worked in specialty coffee for well over a decade as an accomplished barista, a roaster and trainer, also a Q Arabica instructor for the Coffee Quality Institute, as well as an authorized SCA trainer and teacher. Candace is also a past World Coffee Events head judge and is currently the director of roasting at The Crown Royal Coffee Lab and Tasting Room where she oversees production roasting for the tasting room, as well as contributing to the Crown Jewel program and hosting original SCA roasting education. She's also a published writer on a range of topics concerning specialty coffee. Candice was previously a member of several SCA committees, including the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Task Force. And Candice is the vice president of the Coffee Coalition for Racial Equity. Now, in today's conversation, we are going to be addressing a lot of the things that were covered in her Roast Magazine article about thermodynamics. And we are going to not only dive into the science of thermodynamics, but in this conversation, we're going to explore the practical application of thermodynamics in a professional roasting environment. So not only are we going to cover things like where you should be focusing to get your thermodynamics reined in in the roasting process, what systems within the machine and outside the machine you should be paying attention to, best practices for small and large roasters, and a range of topics like that. But we're also going to be talking about how to approach um, learning about the science of roasting itself in the most helpful mindsets that you can have as a roaster to really learn your equipment well, to apply the science that you learn to your context so that you can both run a great business and delight your customers in the process. And Candace just does a fantastic job of being forthright, cutting to the chase, giving you practical science and advice as a very accomplished and leading roaster in the industry. So I hope you're ready to learn a lot. Here now is my conversation on thermodynamics with Candace Madison. Well, Candace, welcome to Keys to the Shop. I'm really excited to talk to you today. Um, how's the day going? Pretty good. Thanks for having me on, Chris. This is a very cool experience. Yeah, I, I think this is going to be a really interesting discussion because it's a really deep topic and it touches on so many other topics in roasting. So I think we're going to have a good time here. Um, you wrote the article, uh, well, they called it Heating Things Up in uh, Roast Magazine, and we're touching on thermodynamics in roasting, which I guess you could say pretty much is roasting uh, itself. I mean, we were talking before the episode here, um, before our interview, about uh, how you approach information and research uh, topics like this. I mean, what kind of brought you to write this article in the first place? Oh, well, it's, um, <laughs> it, it has always been, I've always been a teacher and it's always been a joy to explain what I learn just because it, it's more excitement for me. And then it, as is a very time-worn um, teaching method, it, it, it makes you a better teacher. Um, so I started looking up uh, thermodynamics, chemistry and other things um, to do with real world uh applications on roasting sorry i said that completely wrong um yeah I, I started to look at roasting through a lens of science rather than craft i think i wanted to nail down um this was many years ago i wanted to nail down what i could get right what i could get wrong what was in my control and what was not and in order to do that i just needed a better understanding of thermodynamics of 
of physics, of chemistry. Um, and when I was first looking these things up, um, all I could ever find were, other than the NASA website, were very heavy um, academic texts that I would try and kind of, you know, claw my way through. But I have a tertiary education, I have a college degree, but I'm not a scientist. So I thought, well, I need to write this down in a way that I understand. And I started, you know, writing bits and bobs down in, in notebooks, and I, I still have them everywhere all over my apartment. Um, and then um, a couple of years ago, uh, somebody asked me a very uh, interesting question in a roasting class. And I thought, well, you know what, instead of me looking this up and kind of writing bits in a notebook, why don't I write this down for other roasters to read? Um, and so I wrote a pair of articles. Um, the first one came out, Introduction to Thermodynamics, which I called um, a fairly inadequate introduction to roasting, um, uh, but <laughs> thermodynamics, but Roast Magazine did not like that. And I've just completed a presentation on the introduction to chemistry of roasting, and I'm currently writing an article that will appear in Roast Magazine shortly. So it sounds like you are, uh, you know, you're a curious roaster. A lot of a lot of roasters, you know, people get into roasting are very curious. And it sounds like the process that a lot of us, be you a barista or a roaster, trying to find information, scientific information to back up the practices that you're doing uh, as a roaster, just to make you better at your craft. And so um, I'm super glad that you were able to just like condense all of this and like share it in these articles and presentations. Uh, one of the main takeaways here, like the through line for this whole thing is um, learning the difference between heat and thermal energy. I mean, learning the difference between those two seems to be pretty important. Um, but, so I wonder if you could explain a little bit from what you've found in, in your career and your studies, like why does that matter and what is that difference? Um, it matters for me, I should say, um, in two or three distinct ways. The difference between the two basically is that thermal energy is not in the process of being transferred it's actually a part of the internal system but heat describes that same energy in transit so if i put energy into the roaster if i heat up the roaster and maintain that thermal energy that transfer is not occurring that system is in that particular state whereas if i put cold beans into that roaster all of a sudden heat is taking place because there's a transfer of energy from the high kinetic, um, the, the, the faster kinetic molecules in the hotter system to the lower kinetic molecules in the cooler system. So this energy transfer, this, this movement transfer, this molecules moving faster and faster and i.e. heating up because that's what heat is occurs over time, it's energy in transit. And that's important to understand um, for me personally, because when I'm looking at my system and I'm, I'm thinking all that this is knocking in my head at the moment is exhaust, 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 because that's what made me understand why my roaster was always quote unquote overheating. I wasn't looking at the system as being hot, as being a composite of this thermal energy. I was looking at the heat that only the heat that I put into the system and transferring the heat. So I'd open the doors or I'd open the hopper, I'd cool it down and I'd look at the temperature. I'd look at the temperature probe, the beam probe and say, well, that must be the temperature of the machine. And a snapshot of it, it was. But because I hadn't looked at the exhaust thermocouple and seen that that was far hotter, it meant that the system itself was actually far hotter than I realized. And we used to put beans in and try to use the same heat profile and not understand why my roast would get too hot or they'd run away from me or they would char or scorch. Interesting. So you were not really paying respect to the existing um, the existing energy in the system. And it was really just all about what you were doing. Um, and exactly. now it helps you sort of th bridging that gap mentally, at least like you're going to check all those things first before you make such changes. So I imagine you started to do a few less things, uh, or at least different things yeah. when you started to see what, what you saw before. 
Absolutely. And this is not just for one machine. This also helped me to respect and understand and work faster across multiple machines because understanding how they retain, retained heat and understanding how they work thermodynamically in and of themselves, because every machine is different. Every setup is different. Even if you have this exact same machine, you won't have the exact same stacks or, um, or gas pressure or, or whatever. I mean, so this made me understand a lot more um, immediately um, things that were important as a as not as a, a junior roaster but as kind of like one of those things that I I didn't kind of have on my checklist mentally right at the beginning and that really kind of helped me to understand the nature and relationship of heat to the coffee and I suddenly began to understand roasting as a system and as a whole process rather than why won't my organic Ethiopian naturally processed beans roast correctly Sure. Yeah. And so then I kind of, it kind of brings us to a question of the common mistakes. It seems like one of the common mistakes is to just not put that um, understanding into the equation at all. But when it comes to understanding thermal energy in the roasting process, I mean, you've been roasting for a while. You've, you've trained a lot of people also. So what is it that you see as the most common mistake when we're approaching uh, thermal energy? Let's say we become aware of it but now we're trying to, you know, fold it into our practice, but we're still making mistakes with it. What mistakes are we making? Sure. I think honestly, um, the main issue I see with nearly everything, but definitely with roasters is not taking the time to observe. So a lot of um, people um, will do, will go to the other extreme and just read everything or just take um, the rule of thumb from the roaster that came before them or someone they respected said something on a different machine, but they're sure that it would work on their machine. Um, that's great. The plethora of information that we have now is something I cannot be anything but completely grateful for because there was very little out there when I started. Mm. That being said, if you don't observe and take notes and data from your own machine, you're not actually going to really understand how your roaster works. You might understand the roasting process better, but how that will help you apply it to your, your roaster will be different depending on how the airflow works, how many impellers you have, um, where your um, burners are set, what your burner array looks like. Um, do you have a double wall drum, single wall drum? Do you have a mild steel drum? Do you have a stainless steel drum? Do you have a drum? <laughs> so um, all, of these, all of these things are as important, if not more important than understanding theoretical thermodynamics when you start roasting. Um, I'm just, I, I don't know. I had a lot of time on my hands, I guess. <laughs> well, it is really fun to learn about those things and it, it transfers over to anything we do in, in, in coffee or if we're using machinery in life in general, as a part of our occupation, the theory part of it becomes sort of that, that heady knowledge. But then if, if we're not really observing, like you say, it, it doesn't really do us any good if we can't put theory into action. Uh, so when we're considering, what, let's say we're observing and we're trying to, what, what are we looking for specifically? You mentioned exhaust, and I want to understand the thermodynamics of my roaster. What are sure. the first steps to really take that in in a substantive way that will actually change my practices? Absolutely. So the first thing that you will probably need or want to change if your roasting isn't consistent is looking at your between batch protocol your between batch protocol um, is to me a part of your roast profile it's definitely a part of my roast profile and the, that batch protocol changes um, between coffees um, so I might not have the same protocol for one that I'm roasting as I do the other and the reason I mentioned this is specific to what's happening to your machine in between the roasting. So throughout the roasting, your understanding of thermodynamics is I'm putting heat into a system. I'm creating a hot system, a hot environment for my beans to go into. The beans are also a system, and this is explained in the article. I want to roast them at a certain time and temperature um, with a particular heat application to get a particular flavor profile. If I don't truly know the temperature or the heat profile of my machine itself at a given time, I cannot therefore faithfully put that into my roast profile. So 
I start my beans at 380 degrees. I started the third batch at 380 degrees. Why is it is the drop temperature um, higher? Why is why am I reaching um, equilibrium faster? Why is my drying period um, like why is everything so short? Like so, why is it all running away from me? And that's when I um, I'd suggest that you look at different probes. Everyone's mostly concerned with the bean probe, which they should be. Um, that is well, thermocouples read themselves, but that is ostensibly reading an average of the pile of beans that you have in the drum. But the exhaust temperature to me is they're part and parcel. They're one with each other. I think when Loring set up, they call it the return and some others do too. But this is the um, air that is um, being put into um, your system and what temperature that is in. And also recirculating air, if any, how hot that air is. That tells you how hot your system is. So you may think that you're roasting at 380 degrees. And if you look at your um, data visualization app, say Cropster, Artisan, whatever, your bean temperature will say 380 degrees. You're like, that's roasting great. However, if you look at your exhaust temperature, which um, is usually near your hopper, um, at the front, sometimes it's at the back, but it's usually at the front, um, depending, I should say usually, depending on machine, it's at the back of the front. Um, this is actually telling you the air in the entire system without sort of any interference from the beans, um, anything like that. So in between that, your batches, you may note that this is going up and up and up. If you keep the gas on, if you don't regulate the temperature of your roaster between batches, your system gets hotter and hotter and hotter. So your bean probe will read 380 because that's what the drum temperature is. And your um, beans, when they drop in, will, will fall as they naturally will because they're cooler and um, heat is being transferred to them. However, your system is so overly hot that it's heating those beans at a far faster rate. So your heat transfer is occurring much more quickly than you expect. This wouldn't be a problem if it didn't directly impact flavor. It's fine to go fast. At a certain point, if you're fast and hot, you're losing a lot of the chemical reactions that are dependent on this time temperature transfer. And so once you do that, um, as the roast progresses, you've lost a lot of the flavors and the acidity and sugar precursors that will then mean that your Maillard reaction um, will maybe spotty. Um, it may not uh, go at the correct rate, uh, or those reactions may not go at the correct rate because there's too little moisture. So lots more moisture has been driven off, which means it's they go super fast and then you roar into first crack and you're thoroughly discouraged because you have no idea what's going on. Mm -hmm. Checking things like your turnaround point, your charge temperature, your end temperature, first crack Maillard, all of those things are super important. You can either ha even have different stage markers as, um, depending on the consistency you want. So you can sort of say at three minutes, it should be doing this, at six minutes, it should be doing this, nine minutes, whatever. But if you don't look at what your actual system, the thermodynamics of your actual system, during the roast and between um, batches, you could be trying, you could be fighting with yourself. So it's that ob observation that will help you. It's, I can't tell you what your be between batch protocol should be because I'm not in the room with you. But once you work that consistency into your roasting, you're gonna find that across the entire roast, you're gonna have a far easier work, um, a roast day than you may have just by that simple observation. That makes a lot of sense that you have that uh, between batch protocols, just managing the impact that you uh, yourself almost as a, mm -hmm. a system yourself, like just your the choices of batches sizes that you do, or I don't I don't know this, uh, and I guess it's a question that I should ask here, which is, are there predictable, um, responses within the roaster that will that we should be looking for when it comes to say batch sizes or origins that you know generally speaking deliver um, hotter uh, between batch uh, uh, thermodynamics in the roaster that we should just be like hey that, this is a, a larger batch it's going to give me a hotter temperature between roasts or this is a smaller one and it'll give me cooler how does that work are there is there any kind of predictable indicators or is it just trial and error i mean yes and no because it's really difficult to say like will it be hotter if it's a larger batch not if you don't roast it as hot as a small batch and what size is a larger batch to you versus a smaller batch so those are the sort of things that 
that roasters really need to realize that, that they can call consultants and read books, but it's them and their hands on the machine that are going to guide that process far more efficiently. When we're talking about um, measuring, we're talking about probes, we're talking about observation, all of that. I mean, in, and this is a question that a listener had, um, knowing that we were going to be inter- interviewing you, and it is, mm-hmm. like, how much detail is really reasonable to look into and understand versus getting too consumed with the details? Because on one hand, like you said, we have this plethora of information and these tools, but then we have these observations. So at, at what point do we think, okay, this is a little overkill uh, for what I'm trying to accomplish here? Oh, yeah, it's all overkill, to be perfectly honest. Like. <laughs> Understanding this stuff is great. I don't go into work and like talk like this. Um, I'm teaching my production roaster at the moment. Um, and I love this. this I, they gave me a new one and I'm like, yay. And I said to her, throw some beans in the machine. She was just like, what? And I'm just throw them in, have some fun. And basically that's what I've been teaching her to bit incrementally, bit by bit, you want to learn the mechanics of the job. When you learn to drive a car, you don't t- sit down and tell a 16 year old about engineering. You're not talking about mechanical engineering and you know everything that you know about petroleum gas versus electronic car like manufacture. You just teach them how to make the car go. And then after a while, the other data will either naturally occur to them or they'll get taught, um, probably not in the case of driving a car, but definitely in the case of roasting. And you get to let that inform you. So my best advice is to roast coffee and take notes. Like it literally, once you've got the mechanics out of the way, that's that's the biggest thing you can do as a roaster. It's something I've had to re-remind myself to do this year as well, is to watch the coffee, take notes, see what you can change. The effects and variables that you change are one at a time. You cannot change or control too much thermodynamics. You can turn a machine on and physics takes a hold. You can control the heat that you put into a machine, yes, but you are not, you know, an engineer working out the the entropy state of the universe. You're just roasting some coffee. So all of this to me informs the way that I roast in a very intuitive way. It looks like um, what I'm doing is intuitive and and I'm not really, I'm turning down the gas there and why would I be doing that? What's actually happening is all of the things that I've read and learned are um, informing my mechanics and the way that I deal with a roast without me having to really notice it. So I go back and refer to to things all of the time, even my own articles, because I don't keep that energy, uh, that energy, that um, information in my head. Um, But it's there when I need it and I know where to look. So your reader is very right. You should just go and roast coffee. And if more and more information makes that coffee better and better, that's when you'll take it in. But I don't think anyone should be hitting the books before they hit the roaster. That's a great way to put it, for sure. Um, The uh, other question, I guess, is when we're talking about intuition, developing intuition with what you're doing and letting the scientific information be supplemental to your initial focus of just doing it and uh, paying attention and tracking things. Um, I imagine there's a lot of roasters out there uh, who, because maybe they don't feel too in control of the roaster, are allowing what the roaster has by in way of thermal energy to control what they think they're able to produce in their coffee. So in other, in other words, like they're not setting the standards for their coffee. They're allowing the machine to do it for them simply because they're not able to identify that, that hotter roast at the, uh, in the middle of the production day has turned their coffee to this flavor. And it's easier to just say, well, that's the way the coffee tastes now. Um, and not to, you know, delve into it and really try to switch it up between batches. How do we really overcome that? Uh, I don't want to call it a desire, but it seems like it's just easier to allow um, the natural state of the machine to define for us what we think the coffee has to offer rather than the other way around. Yeah, it's an it's a interesting question. It's always, I get this, I get, I see this a lot. I don't get this as much, but I see it a lot. Like my roaster makes the coffee taste like this. It doesn't though. 
<laughs> your roast doesn't take your coffee taste like that. Your roast, I was told, um, I used to roast on a Loring A15. It was a full convection roaster. Loring no longer makes them. Um, but it was the only roaster that Loring was making at the time. This was 2014, I think. 2015, maybe. Yeah, 2013, something. Um, it was a full convection roaster. And I was told um, by numerous coffee glitterati in the UK, uh, amongst others, that Loring's couldn't roast espresso. It just can't be done, Candice. Um, they don't roast espresso. Um, they're convection roasters. I mean, it. It was ostensibly a full convection roaster, but didn't people know that a lot of drum roasters um, roast with way more convection than conduction? <gasps> Shock, I bet you've been told it hasn't, but it's not true. My um, espresso was entered um, by a very wonderful gentleman called Maxwell Colonna Dashwood into the World Barista Championship. He decided to walk it there and do a whole routine with it. It's really nice of him, he didn't need to. Um, and he came fifth in the world. And I had a bunch of WC, um, WBC champions turn around, give me a thumbs up and a what have you when they were drinking the espresso on stage um, because they, they had told me that it couldn't be done and it wasn't their fault. It's what they had been told. Your roaster doesn't make your coffee taste a roast a certain way. Um, I think Ann Cooper and Rob Host have just done um, a definitive, um, and it, well, I don't know definitive, but fairly definitive study across a bunch of roasters, um, roasting machines to show this. Um, what happens is you lose control of your roaster, exactly what you said, and decide that that is a flavor profile that you want because it's the easiest profile to get. The way to change that and the most immediate and easiest way to change that is to cup. I used to cup every single batch I roasted, even on um, batch roast day. Uh, if you cup every single batch, you will know what's going on with your coffee. If you cup it against your data, that's even better because any small changes you will, even if you don't know how to affect the change, and even if you don't know why there was a change, if you can correlate a taste difference with a curve or a heat implementation difference, you're already halfway to the problem that you're having. That's really good um, in that sort of a, a struggle with, just making it uh, a decision based on what's easier, it it really would be di more difficult for you to accept those results if you were seeing the difference and cupping between uh, batches, between um, just every day. Uh, so it, it makes sense that we could easily convince ourselves that we shouldn't go the easy route uh, because we actually do have more control than we think we do in this process. Um, in the article, it talks about, you know, you know for after first crack, and we all know this is kind of the exothermic time where, you know, things start to get a little wild and woolly in the roaster. Um, and so it seems to me that that's one of the most critical times to, you know, take your headphones off and pay attention if you're having headphones on at all. You probably shouldn't. Um, so yes. what <laughs> what is it that <laughs> we should be um, looking to manage after first crack that will really... Uh, help us create predictability in this really sensitive time of the, the bean being exothermic? Sure. Um, I was just laughing because I do all manner of things when I'm roasting, which I tell people not to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should definitely, unless you're um, on a machine where you can't hear first crack, like a Loring, or um, you um, have such a predictable and consistent um, roasting um, setup, that you don't need to, I observe every first crack. Um, it just informs me um, about how the coffee is doing, especially when I check first crack time and temperature because of aging coffee. So we don't have that problem at the crown because we roast um, new coffees every couple of months. Um, and I actually roast a new coffee or two or three per week. Um, but if your coffee is aging and losing uh, moisture and density, you're going to have shifts and changes in equilibrium's first cracks. And you'll need to have a look at your, um, your profile after a while. But managing first crack isn't just managing first crack. It's actually managing what comes before first crack. So first of all, in order to get proper sugar development, you're going to really want to manage 
the Maillard stage, stage two, and stage one even, to ensure that, that you're not languishing and stalling the coffee out in those two stages or rushing them so that they can't take full advantage of their chemical reactions. First crack is an expulsion of steam. There's um, other gases such as carbon dioxide that's mainly released a second crack, but first crack is a lot of water vapor and steam. So it's actually not about, I take it all the way back to the green coffee metrics. It's more to do um, for me with the process, with the amount of um, free uh, moisture, the moisture percentage, um, and the amount of carbohydrates or the density in general in, in the coffee and the screen size. All of those things are going to impact how first crack can be managed. If you have a lot of moisture, and, um, but it's a very dense coffee, you could, um, and I find this a lot with um, Colombian coffees, you could find that at first crack you actually actually counterintuitively intuitively need more energy to combat the humidity in the drum. So I put up the airflow to wick away any humidity, obviously, and then I turn the, um, the gas all the way down, actually, on the machine that I'm using at the moment. This, this is, again, per machine. And that allows me, once the crack has started and it's rolling, and the energy from the crack has somewhat been absorbed, to put more energy in the drum just as the first crack starts to roll, to turn the energy back up. Um, the heat, and that means that there's no weird dip from the coffee itself on on the rate of rise, or on the um, on the curve itself. That the coffee is suspended through this um, this period when it wants to kind of like just drop and die by the ed added heat. But I haven't added too much because I've taken a little bit of that heat away for like ten to thirty seconds, depending on my batch size and roast, before first crack in anticipation of this. If you have a coffee that's quite dry, um, I find this with a lot of natural coffees, to be honest, from um, Ethiopia and Brazil, but not all. And I don't, I'm very, I'm very circumspect when talking about origin and processes because I feel like even though I'm 10 years in, I'm still learning what's actually a truism and what we in the coffee industry just tend to say <laughs> because that's what we do. Mm -hmm. um, but I tend that, um, to find those those origins, but definitively coffees that are lower in um, density and lower in moisture mean to me that they are not going to have the necessary weight or load at first crack um, to not fly away. So in other words, I actually take a lot of energy out at first crack for these coffees and wait um, for a short while and then put a minimal amount of energy back in to, to again, um, let it ride on that wave of heat until I'm ready to drop it. So you would recommend, I think, to form an opinion about an origin more based on your experience with it, but not totally against making generalities based on those experiences. Yeah, and those experiences are actually born from me looking at the um, origin and then going to the green coffee metrics. So um, I am very, has I, 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 I personally am hesitant, but I'm not saying that you or anybody else should be. I just like to have things very defined before I say yes or no. <laughs> Understandable. Um, so as we're talking about uh, what we're looking for in the roaster, uh, we hear a lot about um, rate of rise. We've talked about that a little bit here um, and flicks in that uh, process. And something else that somebody was uh, curious about from the Keys to the Shop audience was that their, uh, their question was more around um, thermocouples and how they are pretty much non-exact measurements of actual bean temperature, where they're not as precise as, as we might think they are. Are Their question is, like, are flicks actually indicative of bean mass temperature, or are they maybe just measuring the gaps of hotter environmental air um, and I mean, what would your opinion in, in philosophy be on that from what you've experienced? I, I grew up in a time when we didn't have data software. <laughs> 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 I'll be honest with you. I don't really care. Um, I do a little bit care. That's not entirely true. I care about, um, of course, all the data because that's really interesting to me personally, but also makes me a better roaster. But when it comes to flicks and crashes, I'm looking at a Lauren profile here, and it has, if you were to look at it with a squinted eye, a perfect ROR on the exhaust and the um, and the bean um, uh, descent descent. They like look like 
gorgeous like hills, but it doesn't matter because I have ones that flick at the end that taste delicious. Mm -hmm. And that I can't guarantee is from anything other than maybe um, the coffee was coming out and I didn't stop pressing record. And so the heat value, I, I don't know with the exhaust, like I, for the first of all, thermocouples are not reading anything but themselves. Okay, so let's just, <laughs> let's get that quite clear. A thermocouple can only read how hot it is. It can't read how hot anything else is. It's reading the environment surrounding itself. So a bean pile thermocouple is reading multiple, multiple hundreds and thousands of beans against itself. Every bean is going to have a different temperature because that's just the nature of, of, of something you can't, multiple things cannot be one temperature all of the time that's thermodynamics um so this is in process so you is is your thermocouple or anybody's that you're looking at is it a j type or a k type is it grounded or ungrounded is it three or five millimeter all of these things are important my general rule of thumb is if the coffee tastes good you're golden hmm yeah, there's a lot of emphasis being put on these uh, subcategories of measurements, uh, the flicks, the the um, beautiful uh, graphs and everything else, right? Yeah. So <laughs> the same thing could be said for espresso and uh, the fact that an espresso was logged into a you know an app that you might have on your phone as being a certain ex you know, percentage extraction out yeah. and we go, oh, I got 23% extraction on yeah. the espresso. But it, we don't know how that it tasted though. Yeah, I, I, a lot of this, um, I have a lot of thoughts about academia, um, data and inclusion, accessibility and exclusion. I was roasting coffee long before these apps came about and I remember meeting the people that made them and they were great and they have great intentions. They want people to make coffee better. Unfortunately, what a lot of people are doing with this information is trying to be exclusionary or prescriptive. And I think that's rather unfortunate. Um, I think having this data at your hand and to your disposal is awesome. I know how much I weigh, I tell my doctor. Um, my doctor doesn't know what I've been eating. He just knows how much I weigh. It's the same thing with this. I don't know how your coffee tastes, but your graph looks fantastic. That's excellent and also less important than how your coffee tastes. Sure, In, unless we start bagging our graphs and selling them to customers. Exactly. <laughs> I'm not shy. I have to publish mine weekly for The Crown. I publish weekly and I also share all of my production um, curves if people want them. I'm not afraid. I don't have any intellectual property here. And if I did, my curve would not be it. Um, I think that I would love it if people went back to enjoying the fun of roasting, um, enjoying cupping and QCing by taste. I remember I was doing, I was a TED barista for a long time um, at the TED events. I did them in um, um, a, a bunch of places in the world. And one of the places I did was um, Edinburgh for TED Global. And we had a lot of people come over. Um, uh, <laughs> and the Europeans were looking at the English and the Americans like we were crazy. We all had our TDS meters out. We all had our scales out. We all just like, and I remember um, Anne and Charles from Copy, uh, one of my favorite roasters in the world and two of my favorite people in coffee. And Anne came over <laughs> and she just said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm making an espresso. She's like, no, you're not. I was like, well, I need to know whether it tastes good. She's like, put it in your mouth. And I was like, oh, yeah. I had so been taught, <laughs> I'd been taught to TDS away and do everything else except actually really evaluate what it tasted like. <laughs> Amazing. That is great. Uh, yeah. And it's so cool that it was from Anne and Charles that, that the yeah. came. There are going to be uh, guests on the show pretty soon here. Oh, um, awesome. Yeah. And, and that I think is something that a lot of people are talking about in the industry is that now that we've got pretty much uh, the world at our fingertips, and quite literally, we're starting to use our hands less. And yes. it's, um, it's nice to hear people sort of echoing these sentiments and um, kind of putting these things in balance. So when we talk about thermodynamics and energy and heat transfer and, and things like that, 
you know, as well as it should, you know, be something we'd learn. But it sounds like, again, it's just something that's supplemental to just getting out there and experiencing the roasting process. Absolutely. And I think that also there are obvious roast defects. There are obvious things that don't taste good to people. And there are conversely quite obviously things that taste delicious or people love. If you have a roasting operation and you are happy with your coffee, truly happy with the way it tastes and you are selling it and your customers love it, stop paying consultants. You're doing fine. Yeah. Can't perpetually chase something deeper when you've already arrived at the thing that you're actually trying to do. Um, yeah. And I'm not saying don't explore and I'm not saying don't get better or have fun. I'm just saying they sh it should be that it should be fun. Bringing it back to the idea of just exploring a little, like being in more control of what we're doing with thermal energy and heat transfer and all that fun stuff. Um, from this conversation, we want to go to our roasters and you're gonna tell us how to control those elements in our roaster. What are the first things that we should do this week to really start ourselves off on the right foot to make this a process that really helps us achieve what we want in our roasting? I would say that you're gonna to wanna to be consistent across the week. You're gonna to wanna to take a lot of notes and you're gonna to wanna to cup everything so that you can check that what you're doing is correct. You want to make sure that you're applying the most amount of heat up front, um, whether or not you do that before the equilibrium point or after. And then because the bean is moving from endothermic to exothermic, your job as a roaster is to reduce the amount of energy you are putting into the system as the bean takes over as it roasts. Um, I would look to sure that if you're looking for um, acidity to really push that heat in the first um, few minutes of the roast, um, definitely before Maillard. And then maybe look at your airflow. Um, blowing air through the coffee um, will allow it to roast faster or slower at different points, depending on humidity in your system and your impala. But it also opens up to me a complexity of acidity and flavor. Um, you don't want to take the Maillard reaction too fast or too slow that stage. So looking at stage two, my advice would be to lean on that to being the largest. If you're looking at stage percentages, I try not to, but if you're looking at risk ratios, that's like the largest, that's the, the longest amount of time that I spend in a roast is devoted to Maillard because I like really sweet coffee. Um, Depending on the roast, I would look to manage first crack by either um, having my minimum amount of energy there. Um, if I have a really uh, low density, um, low moisture coffee that might fly away. Um, definitely open up the airflow for any scorching um, and allow a lot of that heat to um, be uh, kind of removed from the drum with the airflow as the crack is coming. Make sure that you're consistent with how you mark yellowing. Like it has to be consistent for you, not for me or anybody else. And make sure um, that you're consistent about when you mark first crack. I never mark the first couple of pops. It's like a popcorn um, packet in the microwave. I just wait for it to pop um, a few times so that I know it's rolling. And also um, remember to mark your exhaust temperature at the beginning. Mine is, I try to get mine within three to five, um, if not bang on the same temperature as my drum, um, my bean thermocouple. Um, and ensure um, that you keep an eye on the exhaust and the bean temperature to see whether or not they're working in concert or away from one another. Looking at all of these things, just looking at first and marking them down is going to give you a wealth of information for you then to jump off from. You say, well, I marked everything down that Candace said, and I have my curve and I've looked at my guess and um, I've cupped it. And then I tried it a different way and I tried it a different way and I've cupped all of them. I prefer this one. Then you can go back and you have all the information that you need to know why that happened and at which stages that you made relevant and really impactful decisions that helped your coffee. And then you can look towards 
then you can look towards academia and see why the theory of why that might be and and then employ that with a different coffee if, if it's um if it's appropriate this is all wonderful information and you know what what should we expect in terms of how soon this becomes sort of second nature to us you know like be when you are doing these things obviously you've been doing this for 10 years and if I just start doing it this week and tracking everything, I might not really have the confidence to say, well, this data that I have now will means I'm going to make this decision about coffees here, sure. you know, henceforth. So, I mean, sure. how, what's the turnaround in, in confidence, <laughs> I guess, is what I'm saying. Um, oh God, some people are way too confident and some people are still not confident. I mean, a lot of the roasters that I know, the way they talk about themselves is insane when you think about the work that they've done, the coffee they've produced and like, the amount of people that would just like, you know, <laughs> would kiss the ring if it, as it were. And then you've got others who honestly haven't produced anything or their coffee just tastes mm, and they have all the confidence in the world. Um, I think the thing that gave me confidence and what gives other roasters um, confidence is, is doing it and talking to people. There was nothing like talking to other roasters that didn't help my confidence amazingly well. Well, to know that other people were struggling, to know that people that I really respected also had had these difficulties. Reaching out to the coffee roasting community is, it's never without its um, its pleasure and its, its advantages. I would definitely do that. You can always reach out to me. I uh, Everyone does. So if I'm a little long in answering emails, <laughs> you'll understand why. But honestly, all of us, are, we, we got where we are by having to struggle and I never want anyone to struggle the the thing that you need to understand is that no one was born roasting coffee it's not natural <laughs> it's pretty weird mm -hmm. um it's the confidence in the fact that you're doing something that a lot of people wish they could do or are nervous and that there are always pe always people that you can reach out to my god my instagram um inbox looks like a mess you know like so do do talk to people you're not on your own. Well said. And then consultant, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, Candice, this has really been fascinating. And I, I love this conversation. Thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, where can we find Anna, more information? You. Um, well, I've written for Roast Magazine. There's lots of um, the Roast, uh, the sorry, Royal Coffee um, blog. Um, I do keep meaning to start a website, and I did, and it has a holding page. But since that's been active since 2013, I don't know if that's going to gonna spark up anytime soon. But um, yeah, always reach out to The Crown as well. Um, info at The Crown. I think that's it. But um, info at, um, if you reach out to The Crown, um, any and all of us will answer your questions. It's myself. And then we have Chris Kornman, who also used to roast for Intelligentsia, and Sandra um, Elise Lifborough, who used to um, roast for Blue Bottle. So we have a lot of, of knowledge and minds on stuff, and we'd love to help. Perfect. Well, you've helped us so much in this conversation. Again, thank you so much, Candace. Oh, no, you're welcome. Thanks, Chris. Well, I hope that you enjoyed that episode and that it gave you a lot to think about and some steps to take in your practice of roasting that will make a huge difference in your consistency. If it's one thing that I take away from this conversation is that learning the science behind what's happening in your context is very important, but paying attention, supreme attention to your context and learning your equipment by just doing it and you know, logging the information and learning well, the ecosystem of, of your business and operation is the most important thing. And it's more attainable than you might think when you approach a topic like this, it definitely seems overwhelming. But I, I love how disarming this conversation was to a topic that can seem fairly intimidating. So I would like to say a huge thank you to Candice for joining us on the show, being awesome, breaking it down so well for us. So if you want to learn more about what's going on at the Crown Oak and the Royal Coffee Tasting Room in Oakland, you can just go to royalcoffee.com. Click on the Crown and it will tell you all about their online classes, their podcast, the tasting room and all that fun stuff. And for sure, don't forget to go over to roastmagazine.com slash audio articles and listen to the articles on thermodynamics. Subscribing to Roast Magazine in general is a really great idea. Amazing content uh, in both the audio articles and the magazine proper. So with that, that wraps up our Rate of Rise episode for April. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen today. I really do hope that you got a lot out of this conversation. And as always, I hope that this episode has given you keys 
to the shop.